Today is the 200th anniversary of the death of Joseph de Maistre. In commemoration of that, I decided to do a book review of one of his books, in particular, Against Rousseau. For those who are unaware, Joseph de Maistre was a Catholic right-wing political philosopher who was born in 1753 and died in 1821. Against Rousseau was, of course, written as a response to the philosophy of Rousseau, though in particular it was written after the French Revolution as an attempt to explain the chaos that was going on in France at the time and what the roots of this ideology was. Thus, throughout the book, de Maistre discusses several other Enlightenment philosophers, especially Voltaire, but for the most part it's focused on Rousseau. This ideology is of course still with us today, and thus it isn't very hard to tell how many of the criticisms that are made in this book are still relevant. The first notable thing that I found when reading this book was just how scathing de Maistre was when talking about Rousseau. Throughout the entire book, he continuously insults Rousseau, and it's often quite funny. A few of my favorites are lines such as, Rousseau, who expresses himself clearly on nothing, and, whatever the case, Rousseau lay hold of this subject as made expressly for him. Everything that was obscure, everything that exhibited no specific meaning, anything that lent itself to rambling and to equivocation was his particular domain. This tone continues throughout the entire book, and this might just seem like a frivolous thing to note, but it's actually quite important, because one of the main criticisms that de Maistre makes of Rousseau is that he's an essentially worthless philosopher. He regards his ideas as so stupid as, in a better world, to not really merit any response whatsoever, and the only reason that such a response was necessary was because Rousseau's ideas were currently tearing apart one of the greatest nations of Europe. The question that the book opens with is, what is the origin of inequality, and is this inequality justified? To answer this question, both Rousseau and de Maistre believe that you must go to the origins of society, because from that is how you will discover what the origins of inequality are. Rousseau claims that there are three separate origins of inequality. He says that when man created huts with clay and mud, that created inequality. When society was formed around these huts, and the strongest and most erudite men became popular, that was the origin of inequality. And when people needed the help of other people, that was the origin of inequality. De Maistre ridicules Rousseau for these three separate supposed origins. Thus, it is according to Rousseau that it is this development of early society that caused man to be unequal by bringing them out of the supposed state of nature. From these origins, one thing we see quite clearly reflected in the modern left is that one of their fundamental issues is that they are simply at war with reality. To say that inequality comes from the natural gifts of intelligence and strength is a statement so obvious that it hardly requires to be stated. But to draw the moral considerations from this that the left and Rousseau do draw is to say that the evil that they are protesting against is baked into the very functioning of man. One similar example I have used before is you will often hear leftists complain about how horrible it is that under capitalism you have to work to eat. If you don't have a job, and if you don't continue to do that job, then you won't even be able to survive. Now, considering the extent of the welfare state in most Western countries, this is hardly true in most cases, at least again in the developed world. But there is something more fundamentally flawed in this common left-wing contention. The fact that you must work to eat, that is not a result of capitalism. That is certainly not a result of an economic system which has existed on Earth for only a small fraction of human history. The fact that food and shelter and all the other necessities of life, never mind the many luxuries of modern life, are not created on their own, that is a result of the curse God gave to Adam in Genesis when he said, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the earth, out of which thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return and we will experience that curse until the end of the world. 
perhaps that may seem like a bit of an unnecessary detour from the book at hand today, but I think it is important to emphasize how this, the fundamental conflict between the left and reality, is not a modern innovation. It's not the result of certain modern Gnostic theories. It has been a core element of the left, as we can see, for at least over 200 years. Another core issue with Rousseau is that he, also just as the modern left does, constantly abuses the word nature. As I've already said, Rousseau argues that the origin of inequality comes from when society was first formed, and when man left the state of nature. But what does Rousseau mean by nature? De Maistre identifies four different possible definitions of nature. The first is, nature is the divine manifestation of God which shows up in everything in the world. The second is, nature is the principles established by God for how the world operates. The third, nature is the totality of something, the entire world that we live in, but also the totality of smaller things, such as the nature of humans, or cats, or trees. And the fourth, nature may be used to describe the state of things prior to man acting on it, since man is an animal of action that changes the world around him. In the context that the word nature is used in this book, it is usually either used in the first two or the fourth way. The third way is not particularly relevant. And Rousseau, as do many leftists to this day, rely on a constant shifting definition between these three different definitions. Where we see the same sort of obfuscation today the most is with issues of sexuality. The right will say that this or that is against nature, and the left will say, but don't you know that we can actually find that very thing in nature? The right is using the first or second of de Maistre's definitions of nature, while the left is using the fourth. To say that particular actions can be found in nature, that is, in the world without the effects of man, is to abolish morality entirely, because animals commit all sorts of different acts that, if they had a rational soul, would be considered immoral. What the right means when they use the word nature is that those sexual faculties are not meant for that particular thing, that it is not within the nature of that body part to be used for that. Similarly, against Rousseau, de Maistre argues that the state of nature is against nature. That is, we can find out rationally that man is not made for a world absent his action, absent the things that he can do as a rational creature. We know this because of all the faculties that man is given. His ability to think, his ability to speak, his ability to build, his ability to invent. All the many faculties that God has blessed man with are there to be developed. To stay in the state of nature would be against what God has destined man for. It would be against what man is literally made to do. As Edmund Burke said, art is man's nature. Thus, the point of this part of the book is that that human society should exist, that human society would exist, and that that society would result in inequality are all fundamental aspects of man's nature. Therefore, to return to the question asked at the beginning, what is the origin of inequality? It is not only the result of the unequal distribution of man's goods, it is also the result of the very nature of man, of how man shall and must organize societies. And therefore, it is the nature of man to be unequal. The next question that the book deals with is what is the origin of sovereignty? Rousseau, of course, argues that sovereignty is from the people, a position which was often opposed to the idea that sovereignty came from God. However, de Maistre argues that, depending on what you mean, it can be argued that sovereignty comes from both God and from the people. If all you mean by sovereignty comes from the people is that no government could last if it had all the people against it, and that the sovereignty of that government would quickly become meaningless, then certainly that is true. However, Rousseau's concept of sovereignty coming from the people is false. The social contract, just like his views on the origins of society, is simply a false anthropology. Men do not decide to form governments. De Maistre notes that of all the ancient histories of all the peoples throughout the world, there is never any hint of some sort of primordial convention 
In fact, he notes that all the most ancient histories of the most ancient peoples do not say that they were barbarians. They say that they were gods, that before they had their man-kings, they had god-kings. Such things could just be convenient lies that nations make up to help reinforce the power of their ruling class. However, Demaestra says, Do not be surprised that the antique founders of nations all spoke in the name of God. They sensed that they did not have the right to speak in their own name. That is, he argues that the true origins of sovereignty come directly from God, not necessarily in the concept of God directly intervening in the world through some sort of miracle like he did with Moses. Rather, when Demaestra argues that sovereignty comes from God, what he means is the very order of the world, the fact that there must be rulers and there must be the ruled. This is a fundamental aspect of how God has made the world and how God has made men. To say that this is not true because it's not the result of a direct miraculous intervention is to say that a man is not made by God because he has a mother and father. Thus, there is no social contract. Man does not choose to be ruled. Man must be ruled. So, with the origins of sovereignty established, the next topic is the origins of the particular constitutions of nations. In De Maestra's day, Many argued that to create a truly great and free nation, what it needed was a good constitution. However, De Maestra argues that this gets it completely backwards. He says that a constitution is simply a reflection of what a nation already is. De Maestra says, A constitution in the political sense is therefore only the model of political existence attributed to each nation by a higher power. And, in an inferior sense, a constitution is only the assemblage of more or less numerous laws that declare this mode of existence. Thus, both he and others exalt England. But, he says, it's a mistake to believe that England is great because her constitution is great. He says, rather, England's constitution is great because England is great. The next question is, what is the nature of that sovereignty? The first and most absolute principle of sovereignty is that all sovereignty is absolute. That is, there cannot and is never any checks on sovereignty. Whatever the highest level of government is cannot have any checks on it. If there is something that checks the sovereignty, then that is the real sovereign. A separation of powers is only a division of sovereignty. When they act in consort, there can be nothing that can prevent their power from being wielded. To say that the king is above the law may sound bad, but this is just the very fact of sovereignty itself. A king is certainly not above the moral law, at least not when God's concerned, but because of the nature of sovereignty, there can be no authority which prevents him from acting. Then, after that is the issue of particular government types, that is, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. At its base, De Maestra argues, all governments are essentially some form of aristocracy or another. That is, society is organized into a relatively small ruling class, and then the rest of society is the ruled class. In monarchy, the sole power is not the king. There is still a large aristocracy, but what separates it from other forms of government is that aristocracy is all centered around the king, and he's the one who gets to make the final decisions. Monarchy is structured like a family, in which the men, that is, the children, carry their needs to the father. The worst vice of monarchy is not when the king does too much, but rather when the king does too little. People often complain about both inaction from the monarch and despotism. De Maestra says this is no contradiction. Rather, the problem is that a weak monarch allows the rest of his aristocracy to become petty tyrants. So both the center of the government is doing nothing, while the outer parts of the government is being tyrannical. For aristocracy, De Maestra argues that it is basically like a monarchy that is in a permanent regency. It is the same sort of centralized aristocracy, but without the one single crucial figure of the king to unify the government around. Of democracy, De Maestra argues that true democracy, just like absolute despotism, has never and will never exist. The only way true democracy could exist is if all men were truly sovereign, in which case there would not even really be a government at all. Thus, real-world democracy 
is nothing like the ideal. Instead, he argues that it is just a system in which people are able to elect a ruling class, and that ruling class is no less sovereign than the ruling class in any other of the systems already mentioned. One of the issues with democracy that de Maistre identifies is that it is the most controlled by the passions of the people. Therefore, it's only suitable to small states with virtuous populations. Monarchies are often criticized for the king being free from the law, but de Maistre argues that in a monarchy, only a relatively small amount of people have such an exemption, and as already discussed, this exemption is the very nature of sovereignty. In a republic, though, he argues that the entire justice system is dominated by the passions of the people. Rather than this just being the occasional exception given to a king, passion often takes the place of justice. This is something which I think we can certainly see quite clearly today in modern-day democracies. However, de Maistre says that the most damning criticism of democracy is that Rousseau himself says that it is a system which is only made for gods. If that is true, it's hard to imagine how such a system could ever be used. So again, as I've already said, de Maistre argues that all governments are really just some form of aristocracy or another, and the type of government that a nation is best suited for is based on the natural development that that nation has experienced over a very long period of time. There is no such thing as one ideal government for one ideal place, though de Maistre does certainly exalt monarchy as the best form of government, at least generally. The final issue that we arrive at is what is that actual real-world form of government that Rousseau wants. De Maistre at length quotes both Rousseau and other similar philosophers from the period, and he demonstrates that they all believed that the type of republic that they were looking for has simply never existed. They decried both ancient and present monarchies as false forms of liberty, and made such declarations as that they have never seen a truly republican constitution. Therefore, the reality is, these philosophers, these revolutionaries, they were not really rebelling against one particular form of government. They were not really rebelling against the excesses of the French monarchy. They were rebelling against the idea of authority itself, which, as has already been established, is something which is baked into the very nature of humanity. This is, once again, as I discussed earlier, something which we see quite clearly in the left today. They complain about particular structures and systems, but the thing that they are really at war with is reality and nature itself. Thanks for watching. Please donate to my Subscribestar or Patreon if you enjoy this content, and please remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, and share these videos with anyone who you think will enjoy them. And yes, by the way, I know I'm pronouncing de Maistre wrong. I tried to figure out how to say it right, and I just realized there's no way I'm getting it. And a special thanks to my donors, yourself, Cepheus Rex, Lita, The Right Cafe, Quo Pregranator, Josiah, King of Evil Florida and the Moon, Seth Apex, Richard, Cringewalker, Zian Harris, Thomas Thomas, Augustine, Skytoucher, Max Jerome, Matthias the Templar, and Lewis. Thanks everyone again for watching, and goodbye.